Hi everyone. I have been invited to speak briefly on global health loss. It's a very interesting time to talk about this area. On one hand, there is good news coming from New Zealand, which has become COVID-19 free. Whereas we are witnessing alarming numbers from the United States and now India is climbing the infamous ladder. Keeping in mind the current global scenario, I have chosen to speak for the next few minutes on how to harness the power of law for controlling the spread of infectious diseases. Health risks in the, in the 21st century are beyond the control of any government in any country. In an era of globalization, promoting public health and equity requires cooperation and coordination, both within and among states. Law can be a powerful tool for advancing global health, and yet it remains substantially underutilized and poorly understood. So first, I'll begin by introducing to you a relevant WHO international legal instrument known as the International Health Regulations or the acronym IHR. The IHR is among the world's most ratified, widely adopted treaties with 196 states parties, including all WHO member states, Liechtenstein, and the Holy See. The IHR are legally binding on the entire government, not a particular ministry and states' parties are bound by all of its provisions. The rules expand WHO jurisdiction beyond a narrow band of infectious diseases to the entire spectrum of public health risks of international importance. The cumulative effect of such an instrument could transform the WHO's role and stature in international law and establish a coherent global preparedness framework. Now, state parties such as India to the international health regulations have an obligation to assess and notify WHO of all events occurring within their territories that may constitute a public health emergency of international concern. In the recent past, there have been some controversies on China's obligation with regard to IHR. Now, the purpose of IHR is to prevent, protect against, control and provide a public health response to the international spread of disease, commensurate with and restricted to public health risks and which avoid unnecessary interference with international traffic and trade. The IHR act at the national and international level to provide first ongoing surveillance and response within countries and at their borders and secondly a coordinated and proportionate global detection and control of transnational threats. Above all, the IHR success depends on building capacity in all countries to detect, assess, notify and respond. And that brings me to the role and importance of national legislations. Although not expressly required by the IHR, national health legislation can institutionalize and strengthen the IHR's performance. Because the IHR encompass risks arising from multiple sources, they influence a range of government sectors such as environment, public health, border security, food security, agriculture, animal health, nuclear chemical justice, and transportation. In assessing the adequacy of legal structures, states should consider an equally broad range of laws and regulations. States parties such as India have discretion on whether and how to implement IHR standards, depending on the legal system, domestic policies, and socio-political context. So, what is the Indian legal and policy framework on infectious diseases? Under the Indian constitution, public health and sanitation are the responsibilities of the state and local governments, while the union government manages port quarantine, interstate migration and quarantine. Only about eight states and union territories in India have legislation for public health. India's response to an infectious disease such as COVID-19 is affected predominantly on three structures. First of them being the Disaster Management Act of 2005, which has been invoked recently to enhance the preparedness and containment of COVID-19 at hospitals. This act was passed as an immediate response to the 2004 tsunami and is largely framed from effective preparation, migration, and managing a natural or man-made calamity, mishap or catastrophe, such as tsunami, earthquakes and cyclones. These events, unlike COVID-19, are normally geographically localized, disrupting normal lives for a few days or hours, 
but unlike a public health epidemic, they do not last over a long period of time. The second is the Epidemic Disease Act of 1897. Now, this archaic three-page and four-section legislation does not define what constitutes a dangerous epidemic disease. It confers unbridled powers to the executive to respond to the disease by the way of promulgating ordinance or regulations, but without due care to the social and reputational standing of the people affected due to the pandemic. Final limb is the Integrated Disease Surveillance Program or the IDSP which was established in response to India's obligation under the International Health Regulation. Now, the use of such an ad hoc legal architecture with the multiplicity of statutes has resulted in a patchwork response against the epidemic in several areas. And all this points towards, firstly, enacting a new Epidemic Control and Management Act, and secondly, to have a relook at how to harness the power of law for controlling the spread of infectious diseases. And this brings me to talk about very briefly on some key considerations that are to be kept in mind while establishing a comprehensive legal framework for infectious diseases. First, law can contribute to the prevention of infectious diseases by improving access to vaccination and contraceptives and by facilitating screening, counseling and education of those at risk of infection. Law also has a reactive role, supporting access to treatment and authorizing public health authorities to limit contact with infectious individuals and to exercise emergency powers in response to disease outbreaks. Now, where public health laws authorize interference with freedom of movement, the rights to control one's health and body, privacy rights and property rights, they should balance these private rights with the public health interest in an ethical and transparent way. Public health powers should be based on the principles of public health necessity, reasonable and effective means, proportionality, disruptive justice and transparency. Health laws can improve the success of voluntary screening programs by including counselling requirements, ensuring the confidentiality of test results and protecting individuals diagnosed with particular disease from discrimination. Governments should carefully consider the appropriate role of criminal law when amending laws to prevent transmission of infectious and communicable diseases. For instance, as seen recently, criminal penalties for transmission of COVID-19 may create disincentives to individuals to come forward for testing and treatment or may provide the pretext for harassment and violence against vulnerable groups. Rather, Encouraging personal responsibility and self-protection is critical and should be the focus of government law and policy. Public health laws should authorize compulsory treatment only in circumstances where an individual is unable or unwilling to consent to treatment and where their behavior creates significant risk of transmission of a serious disease. Compulsory treatment orders should restrict individual liberty only to the extent necessary to most effectively reduce risks to public health. Laws should effectively use to integrate the use of technology in public health. And lastly, public health laws may authorize the isolation of individuals and groups who may have been exposed to an infectious disease, as well as closure of businesses and premises and confiscation of property. The exercise of these powers must be based on public health considerations without discrimination on the basis of race, gender, caste, tribal background, or other inappropriate criteria. Public health laws should provide for the fair compensation of those who have suffered economic loss due to a public health order affecting their property or facilities. We are soon entering a new world, the COVID era, and it's integral to keep in mind that extraordinary times call for extraordinary thinking. I would like to congratulate Bhavan Vidyalay Chandigarh for organizing this international MUN conference in such challenging circumstances and on a relevant theme. And I hope it gets participants from world over to think outside the box. My best wishes to the organizers and the participants. Thank you.